I hope you can all hear me. Um, and uh, welcome to this session uh, held by the Department of History, Latin and Political Science here at Langara. My name is Neil Christie. I am the chair of the department here. And the way that the, uh, the way that this session is going to work is that I'm going to give you a little sampler uh, of what we do at the college um, by giving a short lecture on the Black Death, its impact on Europe, and, the, and what we can learn from it in these modern days of pandemic. Um, but first of all, I guess I get to introduce me uh, giving a lecture on the Black Death. So what I'm going to do now is try and share the screen with you if the technology cooperates. So let's see what happens if I do this. And then we're going to go to that. Uh, can I just get someone to confirm that you can all see my uh, uh, my slideshow, please? I can see it, Neil. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, well, before I begin this, I do want to take the opportunity to thank everyone who's in, been involved in setting up this session. Uh, this includes um, uh, Mr. Mashman, who has sort of taken the lead on this in collaboration with the people in our recruiting department, uh, Ray and Rod, Rod from registration, Wendy from CNM. Uh, thank you to Stephen for joining us as well. And also thank you all of you for coming uh, because it would have been a bit strange if nobody had turned up, frankly. We are living in a time of pandemic, as undoubtedly everyone here is aware. And so I wanted to take this opportunity to look at another pandemic, uh, the so-called Black Death that ravaged Europe in the 14th century. I'm going to discuss the origins of this uh, I'm going to look at the impact it had on Europe, and I'm also going to think about what we can learn from it as we move forward in these times of COVID-19. Now, we call this disease the Black Death, and that was a term that was coined in the 16th century to reflect the devastating impact that historians of the 16th century felt that the disease had had as they looked back at Europe in the 14th century. In the Middle Ages, though, people didn't call it the Black Death. Uh, they called it the pestilence or the plague or maybe the great mortality. And it was actually the second major wave of the disease. Uh, it had actually once already struck the Mediterranean region between 541 and 750. This was the second wave. Uh, there would actually be a third one that would strike China and India and places elsewhere between 1855 and 1959. So that's pretty late. As far as I know, it even got as far as Australia. Now, the disease itself is caused by a bacterium called Yersinia pestis. And this was the name that was given to it uh, when it was identified by a Swiss bacteriologist and physician by the name of Alexandre Yassin, who's the rather dashing looking figure that you see on the left. The disease is found in the digestive tracts of fleas, and especially fleas who live on and feed off rats. Um, and in particular, in the Middle Ages, it was very common to find Yersinia pestis on black rats, the so-called ratus ratus, the rather cute little friend you have down there in the bottom right. But of course, in cases where the rat popul population is reduced, uh, the fleas will quite happily turn to other hosts, including other rodents or humans, which means that the disease will then transfer between the rats and the various other uh, rodents and the humans that the fleas are basically jumping between. Now, the plague comes in three main varieties, and the most well-known of those is the bubonic plague, uh, so-called because of the swellings known as buboes that appear in victims of the plague, particularly in the groin region and also underneath the arms. Uh, as you can see, this 15th century artist has gone a little wild in depicting buboes all over the victims of the plague rather than simply in the places where they would actually appear. But there you go. The bubonic plague, interestingly enough, is actually the least deadly of the three. Uh, it's actually not necessarily guaranteed that you will die if you get bubonic plague. What's actually more of a problem is that the plague also comes in two other varieties, the so-called septicemic plague, uh, which basically infects your bloodstream and kills you. Almost everybody who gets it dies of it. And then we have the pneumonic plague. The pneumonic plague basically 
what happens is the bacilli attack the lungs and you get symptoms that are similar to pneumonia that will eventually kill you. It's not as fatal as the septicemic plague, but the real problem with the pneumonic plague is that it's highly infectious and it can be passed around by coughing in particular. From the records that we have, it seems likely that the pneumonic plague was the variety that was most widespread during the time of the Black Death. So, how did it all begin? I'll ask you to turn your eyes on this slide to the right and to the Gobi Desert, because as far as we can tell, that's where it starts. In the early 14th century, rodents and humans who were living in the Mongol Khanate that included that region, and were living in that region specifically, picked up the disease. And then it started spreading east and west along the trade routes, roughly marked out in red on your map there. Now we don't know too much about what happened when the disease got to China, because the Chinese historians don't like to talk about it very much, but it seems likely that by 1393, it had killed about a quarter of the population in China. Meanwhile, it was heading west, spread along the trade routes by both merchants who were traveling along those routes, and also the rats and other rodents that were either living, you know, hidden in bales of hay or whatever, and also, being spread from rat to rat, rodent to rodent, as they also came in contact with each other as the plague spread from the east to the west. In late 1345, it reached Genoese settlement at Kaffa. Now, Kaffa is modern day Phoenicia. Uh, you can see it just at the northern end of the Black Sea there. At the time, Kaffa was under siege by the Mongol rulers of the state known as the Golden Horde. And a traditional story states that the plague appeared in the Mongol camp. And so the Mongol ruler decided he was going to share the misery by catapulting plague-infected bodies into the city of Kaffa. And thus it was picked up by Italian merchants and spread from there. Now that story is probably apocryphal. We're not actually talking about an early case of biological warfare. But it seems likely that the plague was picked up by by rodents and humans at Kaffa, and then it spread further from that city along the trade routes. As you can see, trade routes are a big vector for disease spreading, as basically people spread. By 1347, the Black Death was in Constantinople, and from there it spread along the trade routes, both east and west. By 1349, it had reached all of the Muslim world, including the holy cities of Mecca and Medina, and eventually it was going to wipe out a third of the population of the Muslim world. By 1349, it was also well advanced in Europe. It completed its conquest, if you like, of Western Europe by 1351, by which time it had also run its course in the Mediterranean basin. But it then continued to spread east into Eastern Europe over the next couple of years. It remained within Europe, and there were a number of of outbreaks over and over and over again in various different places, as late as 1665 in England and 1720 in France. So what I'm going to do now is turn our attention specifically to Europe and the impact that the plague had there. The initial wave of the plague between 1347 and 1351 killed about a third of the population but then more people died in subsequent outbreaks. And basically by 1400, the population of Europe had been reduced to half the population that it was before 1347. It actually took almost another century for the population to begin to recover back to reasonable levels. And as I noted, there were further outbreaks that followed in the centuries that came after. And the onset of the plague caused widespread panic because nobody understood it. Nobody understood what had caused it or why they were suffering from it. Some people decided that it was the work of the devil spreading misery among humanity to turn them away from God. Others felt it was the work of God angry with a sinful humanity and punishing them with this plague. The faculty of, the, of medicine at the University of Paris tried to Dr. more intellectual approach and declared that it was the result of an unusual planetary conjunction between Saturn, Jupiter and Mars in the sign of Aquarius, 
in 1345 that had caused the air to become corrupt. And as a result of that, people were getting sick and dying. A number of other people offered other alternatives covering a whole range of different um, rationales, including uh, lust with old women or possibly overeating. Uh, one university declared that the foul vapors came from the south, so the way to avoid dying of plague was to orientate your house such that the windows and doors faced north. One general view of medieval doctors was that if you engaged in bathing or exercise, you were opening up the pores of your skin, which made it easier for the disease to get in. So they advised people against exercising or washing themselves in order to avoid getting sick. Obviously, that caused a whole range of problems um, that we can think about. But there you go, let's maybe not and move on. Unfortunately, some people decided that humans were responsible. And of these, most people blamed the Jews, a community who had been marginalized in Europe for centuries and were now being accused of poisoning Christians. We even have records of some confessions from Jews who admitted to poisoning um, Christians, but these were, clearly, um, these were clearly extracted under torture. In some cases, it's actually explicitly noted that they were under torture. So obviously one cannot give those any credibility. Unfortunately, there were hideous massacres of Jews in Germany in 1348 and 1349, even though the Jews themselves were also getting sick. Others blamed people who were suffering from leprosy and lepers who were already, again, a marginalized community, uh, were now being further shunned or even killed as a way to try and put down the disease. Some scholars have suggested, actually, that the reason that leprosy mostly disappears from Europe by 1400 is because of a mixture of the fact that lepers, because they had compromised health systems anyway, were very much vulnerable to the disease, and the fact that they were being uh, driven out and persecuted and killed by others in Europe, and scholars are still debating about. So there was a lot of variation in how people felt it was best to respond to the plague. And this is perhaps best summarized in the introduction to the Decameron, which is a work by an Italian, Florentine specifically, writer by the name of Giovanni Boccaccio. Boccaccio tells us that in Florence where he lived, some people shut themselves away and lived sober lives of restrained moderation, hoping that this would prevent them from getting sick. Others felt that the better approach was eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. And so they did so with great enthusiasm, eating and drinking and making merry, obviously not so much the dying. Many people simply fled. And Boccaccio tells us that at this time, you even had cases of family members abandoning each other, such that those who were left were dependent basically on the charity of others to um, ensure that they would get treatment. Funerals were conducted hastily, and eventually the death toll became so great that they were simply throwing people into mass graves. Meanwhile, in Florence and also other cities in the Italian peninsula, they were trying to enact measures to improve hygiene, despite what the doctors were telling them and also to minimize the spread of the plague. Some cities actually tried to block immigration and just stop people from coming in as a way to stop the illness from coming in. Needless to say, the effect of that was relatively uh, limited. The church suffered a great loss of its clergy. Half of the College of Cardinals were wiped out and they had to reduce the standards for ordination in order to enable them to keep bringing in enough priests to conduct the religious services. Meanwhile, the remaining clergy were left scrambling to try and basically provide pastoral care for their flocks. The Bishop of Bath and Wells in England in 1349 advised priests to tell the men in, his parish, in their parishes that if they felt that they were sick or dying, they should make their last confession to each other, or if there were no men present, at least make a confession to a woman so that they wouldn't die with their sins unconfessed. Yes, medieval patriarchy continuing to um, operate there in the background. Monasteries and nunneries were absolutely shattered because these were 
monks and nuns living in close proximity to each other. If one of them got sick, they basically made everybody else sick. And we see whole monasteries and nunneries basically being completely depopulated as a result. Meanwhile, others were taking religious concerns into their own hands. And we see the resurgence of what we call flagellant movements. Now, these had previously appeared in the late 13th century in Italy and southern Germany, because at the time people had felt for various reasons that the end of the world was coming. And so a way that you could try and get God to forgive you for your sins was to wander around in a procession flogging yourself. During the plague years, the flagellants reappeared, again, presenting the plague as a punishment from God and preaching that forgiveness would be given to anyone who joined their bands and traveled in a procession flogging themselves for 33 days. Now, the, the flagellants started to become a problem when they started attacking reg, um, the uh, regular clergy and the Jews. And so they were actually eventually put down, suppressed. So in some cases, actually, they managed to uh, establish better relations with churches and became incorporated into those churches. The psychological impact of the plague is something that we also see appearing in art and literature. We see the appearance of treatises on the art of dying, telling us how to die a good death in the face of the plague. We also see the increasing appearance of death themes in other forms, uh, one of which is the so-called dance of death or danse macabre, uh, which we have examples of dating back as early as the well, early 14th century. And these are depictions of people from various social classes. You'll see in this image here on the left, you have an abbot and a bailiff. And they're each being led in a dance by death in a way that reminds us that we are all destined to the same fate, regardless of what our origin is. This is a, a, a rem I mean, these dance of death images and dance of death Poems, of which you can see some examples underneath, uh, were performed in various contexts or presented in various contexts. You see the images appearing on the interior of buildings, for example, as well as in uh, written works like these. Uh, the poems not only uh, were read aloud at various social gatherings, but also put on as plays. So that obviously is something that is more open to a wider population. So it's a great way of uh, transmitting, if you like, this form of literature. Meanwhile, we also have so-called transi tombs or transition tombs, which appear around this time and, and afterwards and are frankly just cool. Um, you have two effigies here. You have the effigy of the dearly departed. In this case, uh, you have John Fitzalan, the 14th Earl of Arundel, um, who is lying in state at the top of his, on top of his tomb. And then underneath you have a second effigy that lets us know what John Fitzalan really looks like. And these are often very detailed images of rotting corpses. Sometimes they have worms crawling into them or maybe crawling out. Um, so reminding us that, you know, it doesn't matter what our social class is, we are all worm food ultimately. There's been some debate about this among scholars actually, because as anyone who's looked at a worm knows, it's difficult to tell which end is the head and which end is the tail. So when we see depictions of worms on effigies like these, are they burrowing into the body, reminding us that we are all just going to be eaten by worms eventually? Or are they actually coming out of the body as a symbolic representation of the fact that when we are all raised on the day of judgment, our bodies will be purified and we will be presented uh, to God in our true form, uh, ready to be judged and sent on to our appropriate uh, fate. That's something that scholars again continue to debate about. Something So the corpse might be a symbol of doom and gloom, or it might be a symbol of hope. Make of that what you will. So why did the Black Death die out? Until recently, the most commonly held view was the view that you'll find if you check out the special features on the DVD of Pixar's Ratatouille, which is the, the um, suggestion has been that the black rats were simply outbred and pushed out by Norwegian brown rats, the so-called Ratus norvegicus, of which you see one example on the right here. But there is a temporal issue here because as far as we can tell from the records that we have, the Norwegian brown rats only displaced the black rats as late as the 18th century, which suggests that 
if this was the case, more people should have died of plague before the brown rats came and saved us all. So we have to throw out that idea. But there are other factors that probably had more of an impact, one of which is that people develop resistance to disease over time. That just happens. And so probably there were more and more people who were resistant to the plague enough that it was uh, that it gradually receded. As I said, there were a number of outbreaks, but enough that it, the whole widespread pandemic um, died down, if you like. The other thing, though, is that this is a time when there are great improvements in medicine, which helped to minimize the, pl the effects of the plague. And so what I want to do now is actually move on to consider some of the longer term effects of the plague, and in particular, the reverberations in medical practices, as well as some other things. So the plague had highlighted a number of flaws in the medical practices of the time. Academic medicine was mostly based on theories uh, that had been recorded um, on the basis of ancient Greek or Roman thinking. They were, it was very much theoretical medicine. It wasn't very practical in application. Meanwhile, you have a lot of popular amateur uh, doctors, if you like, who are using remedies ranging from, you know, I of mute and all the rest of it, uh, some of which work and some of which don't. At the same time, though, more and more, the use of surgery and scientific observation were becoming part of the medical canon. And the late 14th century actually sees the establishment of the surgeon as a profession alongside the physician, to the point that in 1356, the University of Paris introduced Bachelor of Surgery and Master of Surgery degrees. That change in uh, approaches was actually then leading to an increasing emphasis on the scientific method, by which I mean we post a hypothesis, we test that rigorously using analysis and observation, and we then confirm or deny that hypothesis and develop a new one if we need to. Another thing that changed was the function of hospitals. Because before the plague came to Europe, a hospital was a place where you left somebody who was sick and was going to die. Hospitals were not originally intended to cure people. The patient who was deposited at the hospital was expected to die. Their property was disposed of. And in some cases, a religious service was actually said to them, giving them the last rites as they went into the hospital, because at some point they were going to die. But after the Black Death struck Europe, we saw, see more and more hospitals actually trying to cure the sick. The success rate was low, but it was greater than it had been previously. We start to see the development of separate wards where they are putting different people on the basis of what ailments they're suffering from. And it's not ideal because people are still having to share beds, but at least they're doing things like cleaning the sheets or changing the sheets every day, uh, washing things with running water, uh, flushing waste with uh, water. And also some of them were actually adding medical libraries as a reference, if you like, for their uh, medical treatment. Meanwhile, there are also changes taking place in health and sanitation laws. This starts in the city of, in cities in Italy and then spreads to the rest of Europe by the 16th century. The leader in all this was the city of Milan, which had been ahead of the other cities in the reactions to the plague as well. It had instituted a public health board with sweeping powers and other cities then followed suit. These boards established quarantines, restricted the movements of people, kept records of who was sick, inspected foods and markets. Sometimes they controlled the sanitation system and health and drug production and hospitals. Um, some actually had the power to arrest and punish people who contravened their rulings. They also hired physicians who became specialist plague doctors, paid pretty well and sent out to deal specifically with cases of plague. Over time, those doctors developed a distinctive uniform, uh, which you see an example of here, uh, an all covering uh, suit, if you like, with a hat that is intended to protect the doctor from the plague. Likewise, the beaky mask that the doctor is wearing is stuffed with herbs that are intended to filter out the evil airs and help the doctor to avoid getting sick. Obviously, some of these doctors did get sick, um, but I guess the money was worth it. The Black Death was also bringing about important social changes in Europe, and we see this particularly at the level of townsfolk and peasantry. 
The early 14th century had already seen expressions of discontent on the, on the, on the behalf of the lower classes at the way that the upper classes, the nobility and the senior clergy were treating them. The depopulation that resulted from the plague merely made the situation worse. And it really starts to show by the late 1370s after there have been repeated waves of plague that have wiped out an awful lot of people. Because we now have craftspeople, manufacturers, uh, and uh, peasants who are in short supply, which meant that they were able to start charging greater amounts for their work. It also meant that if a peasant felt that he was being mistreated on the estate of one particular lord, provided he could find another one who would pay him better, he could move relatively easily. As a result of increased wages, the peasantry and the artisans and the other town classes, if you like, were now able to afford better food, uh, finer clothing, and it got, began to get to the point where it got difficult to tell peasants and, sorry, lower classes and upper classes apart because they were beginning to dress in the same kinds of fabrics. So governments started passing laws intended to limit what uh, people from the lower classes could wear and what they could consume. Uh, they also tried to cap wages and impose taxes on the lower classes. This actually led to major rebellions in England and France in the late 14th century. Now, the ongoing exercise by peasants of their economic power as an in-demand labour force, as well as further acts of resistance, mean that by 1500, we see the end of serfdom in much of Western Europe. Now, for some lords, this was a complete and utter disaster because they basically derived their income from peasants working their estates for them. Now the peasants are going off and working for someone else. They have nobody to collect the harvests. It's a big mess. Others, though, were quite nimble and were able to switch to activities that required fewer hands on deck, as it were. So a good number of them are actually switching to animal husbandry, which is actually quite lucrative because in addition to the fact that you're producing meat that people are eating, and at the time people are eating more and more meat, of course you get leather from cows, you get wool from sheep, you get all these animal products that you can also sell and use to um, make money. Meanwhile, others were developing techniques that were intended to maximize profits and address the shortage of labor. Dutch fishermen around 1380 were developing new methods for salting, drying, and storing fish, which then meant that they could keep it for longer periods, transport it over further distances. Meanwhile, throughout Europe, we are seeing new techniques being developed for working in mines that are actually making it safer and are making it, um, more and make it possible to dig deeper mines, as a result of which we get more and more people attracted to the mining profession. Meanwhile, the merchants are forced to adapt as the market shifted. So, to sum up, we can see that the Black Death had a widespread impact wherever it went, but it's worth thinking more about the effects that it had, and these are things that we can all learn from as we live through COVID-19. Of course, there was depopulation in the areas that it struck, and also an immense psychological impact. And we saw that expressed in a number of ways, including in uh, artistic developments. Now, the fact that we see people in the 14th century reacting with panic and confusion is a reminder for us that our own reactions to COVID-19 of confusion uh, and uh, great concern are natural reactions. They are not unusual. Uh, this is how people react to pandemics. Of course, in the Middle Ages, there was less concern about toilet paper, but there you go. We can also talk about the economic impact of the plague, both in terms of short-term and long-term effects. We saw disruptions of agriculture. We saw the need to switch to different uh, types of economic activity. We saw the effects that this had on trade and on technology. This, for us, reminds us that we need to also be economically nimble. We need to think about new approaches to our economic activities approaches that will enable us to uh, continue, continue to be productive in society while at the same time minimizing risk to other people, uh, minimizing the potential impact uh, that the disease can have on people in the working environment. 
We can also look at the attempts that people made in the Middle Ages to regain divine goodwill. And as we saw as part of this, we unfortunately see the appearance of great prejudice, particularly against Jews and lepers. In the modern day, there have been cases of prejudice against particular cultural groups, uh, people from particular countries, uh, people from particular religions uh, that have been a result of the um, COVID-19 experience. Uh, so something that we need to bear in mind is that we are as vulnerable to allowing intolerance to exist in our society as the people in the 14th century were so we need to take action to ensure that that doesn't continue. Another thing we can look at is healthcare. Um, obviously I've shown you a whole bunch of different developments that happened in healthcare in the Middle Ages in response to the plague and they remind us that we also really need to place huge value on our healthcare services. We need to invest more heavily in healthcare and in helping those who work in healthcare to be safe and effective in their careers and in their jobs and in their practices in their activities in a way that goes beyond simply going out at seven o'clock every night to give them a round of applause. And finally, I wanted to highlight the effect that the Black Death had on the European lower classes. Because as we saw in the Middle Ages, it led to a decline and disappearance of, the, of serfdom and of many of the ways that estates were being run at the expense of the peasants. The relevance that that has for today, of course, is the fact that the current pandemic has also highlighted the need for us to have employment systems that have fair wages and fair working conditions uh, for all workers, including supports for workers who are finding themselves in difficult situations now as a result of the effects of the COVID pandemic. Some of you may uh, have seen in the news that last week, some of the supermarket chains decided they were no longer going to give their uh, people on the shop floors uh, the bonus to their pay to help support them through the COVID um, pandemic and in recognition of the essential work that they're doing. Uh, they decided to rescind that, which you know is grossly unfair. Uh, we need to value our essential workers healthcare workers and others and ensure that they are supported and we need to value the people who are unable to work at the moment who are who are working in a limited capacity and ensure that they are also protected in society and supported so today i've looked only at some of the major effects of the black death on europe but hopefully in the process i've highlighted a number of things that we can learn from events of the 14th century the Black Death changed the world in immense ways that we are still feeling the impact of today. And there is much that it has to teach us as we ourselves live through a pandemic. Thank you. <laughs>